I'm Ellie Kohanim. Thank you for joining me in this conversation. Jay Ruderman is the president of the Ruderman Family Foundation, one of America's largest Jewish professionally run Jewish foundations. With a focus on inclusion of people with disabilities in Israel and the Jewish community worldwide, as well as on educating Israeli leaders on the American Jewish community. Jay also serves on the board of directors of the Jewish Funders Network, is a member of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee's Executive Committee, and has served as APAC's leadership director in Israel, as well as APAC's deputy director in the New England region, among many leadership roles. It's now my honor and pleasure to introduce Jay Ruderman to our JBS audience. Great to be here. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Jay. Jay, so, you know, you are all over social media. You're on Facebook, you're on Twitter, mm -hmm. you write blog posts and opinion pieces. And in thinking of you and all the advocacy work that you do, I would venture to call you an activist philanthropist. Does that sound right to you? I think that's right. I mean, we're going in the direction of advocacy. Um, we do a lot of investing in major Jewish organizations around the world. And the service providing, allowing children to go to school, people to go to summer camp, um, you know, housing, employment, those we work with organizations. But we found that the advocacy piece, talking to the community and explaining what we're doing and why we're doing it, that we do that best ourselves. So we've just ramped up those efforts. Right. And, I, and like I said, I've been following you, and I think that your advocacy work has been incredible. I'm just curious, Jay, what is your vision for the Jewish community? Where would you like to see us? Well, first of all, regarding the social media piece, I think that we should be an interactive Jewish community. I don't like the idea of the philanthropist or the funder in the background sort of determining the direction of the community without interacting with the community. And that's part of the reason why I've been very active on Twitter and Facebook and, and, and social media. But um, if I would have a critique of our Jewish community, most of the Jewish organizations and Jewish funding goes to the same objective, at least here in North America. It's Jewish continuity. How do we interest our children in remaining Jewish and remaining involved in, in the community? Whether we send books to families or send children to Israel or day schools or camping. It all has the same objective. However, we look at the future of our community in a certain way. We look at young, highly educated, upwardly mobile families, individuals, and that's how we see our future. We're not good at including people with disabilities, the elderly, gay and lesbian community, Jews living in poverty, there are intermarried families, there are all sorts of groups that are pushed to the edges. And I think ultimately we're building a community that's unattractive to the very young people that we're trying to attract because they're used to living in an America that's already more inclusive where race and sexual orientation and physical ability or any ability is not really an issue. So in our community, I think we need to catch up to the rest of America and that's our message we're trying to get across. Fabulous. Jay, what would you say is the greatest barrier to greater inclusion in the Jewish community? Well, I think you have to look at, um, first of all, the idea of chesed, or the, the, the concept of chesed, which is very important in the Jewish community, sometimes is a barrier. Because you could use chesed to say there are poor, unfortunate individuals who are less well off than, than us. And therefore, that often leads to segregation. We're going to help them by putting them in a separate school. We're going to help them by putting them in separate group homes. Or we're going to help them in putting them in segregated programs. We have to move beyond that, saying that inclusion is good for all of us and that people with disabilities have the right to be part of all aspects of our community, whether it's synagogue life or camping or schools or trips or whatever the community is doing, that should be inclusive for everyone. You know, um, Jay, I, I think I mentioned to you earlier that I attended a conference that the Ruderman Foundation organized in New York and had the pleasure and really an honor to meet um, one of the participants, Sharon Shapiro-Lacks. Mm -hmm. And the conference was, was really focused on self-advocacy in the disability community. Meeting Sharon had such a profound effect on me. And um, so, so I'll share her story for, for just a minute. Um, at two days old, Sharon... Uh, 
in the hospital she was born there was a mishap and, and developed cerebral palsy. And so since then Sharon gets around in a motorized wheelchair and um, she has what she has termed this coin a CP accent. And so, you know, the way she describes it is that someone might have a Spanish accent and you learn how to hear them and it's the same thing with her accent and, and in fact we had a really profound conversation. What Sharon told me was that her synagogue was not handicapped accessible, so she joined the board of the synagogue in order to change that. And I just thought to myself, what an incredible sense of empowerment, and how many of us actually, when we face an obstacle, do something the way that Sharon does. And I'm just curious, in your work uh, with, the, with the community, the disabled community, what have you found to be surprising? Well, first of all, Sharon's a great activist and we've been friends and supporters of her for a while. Um, and there are other great activists out there in our community, people with disabilities who are great advocates. And it's important for us as a foundation, when we work on this issue of inclusion, that we don't come at it from a patronizing point of view, that we include people with disabilities in the decisions that we're making and, and the direction that we're going in. And that was part of the convening that, that, that you talked about. Um, I think that, that the barrier here is that we look at people with disabilities and we see their disability. And by the way, the arguments against inclusion are it's too expensive and it's too complicated. First of all, it's not that complicated. We have the technology, we have the know-how how to include people in Jewish life. There are experts out there in every movement and, and in the Jewish community. As far as the expense issue, we live in the wealthiest Jewish community in the history of the world. The money is there. We just have to inspire people that a more inclusive community is better for all of us. And by the way, when you interact and when you work with people with disabilities, often we find, especially with young people who are volunteering in Yachad or other programs like that, they often dedicate their lives to working with dis people with disabilities, not out of a chesed point of view, but it makes them better people. And so I think we have to look at people with disabilities and say they're people. They have a Jewish soul, just like we do, and they have the right to be included. So Jay, what would you like us doing more of in the Jewish community? Where are you finding the least access? I think mainly what we're focusing on is a change of attitude. Because when you change attitudes, we want to get to the point where we put our foundation out of business, where we don't have to advocate and we don't have to put millions of dollars into inclusion because every synagogue and JCC and school and every aspect of our community will say, of course we have to be inclusive. If we're not, we're a bad actor. I mean, if you, if you take disability and you say race instead, you know, it's inconceivable to us that separate but equal is acceptable. But with disability, it's still acceptable. And we have to move beyond that. And we, we have a long way to go. Well, I know that there's no one who knows that more than you do, Jay. Um, you wrote a recent opinion piece advocating for the innovative perspectives that people with disabilities often bring to the workplace as well. And you mention um, some of the great men of history, including Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Albert Einstein, Ludwig von Beethoven. What do you think the workplace can gain from, from including more people with disabilities? So with our experience, and we have a major uh, employment initiative in Boston called Transitions to Work, which places young people with disabilities in the, in the workplace. When they're in the workplace, it's a transformative impact on the workplace. So people feel better about where they're working. I attended a graduation ceremony for the Transitions to Work program. And of course, you had people with disabilities and their families. And they were all emotional because for many of them, this was the first time they were going to have a job. But I was looking at the people that were accompanying them. So the orderlies in the hospital, this was a graduation ceremony in a hospital, were in tears. This was the most meaningful thing that they ever did in their life, in, in their career. So I find that, that including people with, with disabilities in the workforce isn't just charity. It's not just doing a good thing for the person with disability, but it's making our workforce better for all of us. Jay, um, your foundation is doing incredible work in terms of creating competitions, um, acknowledging people and organizations in the field who are doing great things in terms of inclusiveness in, in the community. Can you tell us about, I know there's at least two competitions, can you tell us a little right. bit about them? Well, what we're looking to accomplish is to shine a light on excellence and inclusion. And, and hopefully the community will look at these uh, ideas or, or these programs of excellence and say we should emulate them, that they're the gold standard. So. 
we're in the fourth year of a program called the Ruderman Prize in Inclusion, which recognizes Jewish organizations around the world that have excelled in inclusion. The application process has is, is just been open. So there's five awards of $50,000 each, and they've gone all around the world from South Africa, Australia, Argentina, Russia, England, across the U.S., Israel, and other places. Um, and we're looking, you know, in a community, let's say in Houston, Texas, that they'll look at uh, their organization and their community and say they've really excelled in inclusion and we should try to emulate them. The other, the other thing that's going on at the same time, we have a partnership with the Jewish Week, which is um, a leading Jewish newspaper based in New York, called uh, Best in Business. And that, we're looking for nominations of companies um, that have really excelled in employing people with disabilities again, to shine a light on them. And we found that when the employer has experienced inclusion, they become the leading advocate. And so, for example, I have a friend in Boston who's hired several people with disabilities. Now, he is in the automotive business, and he's gone out to all of the other dealerships in, in eastern Massachusetts and said, look at the success that we've had. It's transformed our workplace, and you should follow our example. That sounds incredible. Um, Jay, I, in reading about the, the Inclusion Prize, um, I noticed lists of past winners include a bakery, a JCC, a synagogue. Can you tell us a little bit, a little bit about any specific projects that, that really caught your attention? So we're looking for ones that have done something unique. So it's not just disability organizations that are moving in the direction of inclusion. We're also looking for, like for example, a synagogue uh, in St. Louis, Missouri that has really gone above and beyond in including people with disabilities and really you know, look at them as an example to all synagogues. How did they do that? I'm just curious. I think that, first of all, it's a change in attitude. The rabbi has to get up from the pulpit and say, we want to include people with disabilities. I mean, that, that's the first step. I mean, yes, there are things, physical um, accommodations and other accommodations that need to be made, but first of all, it's a change in attitude, that we're a welcoming place. You know, recently, we heard a story in Boston of a family that approached two synagogues, they had a son with a disability, were turned away from both synagogues and joined a Unitarian church oh. where they were welcomed. So that's unacceptable in our community. We can't be like that. We can't say to families, first of all, it's 20% of our population. We don't realize it, but almost every family has a connection with disability. And when you say your son or daughter or brother or friend can't participate in our synagogue, you're turning away a large portion of our community. We, we can't afford to do that in such a small community. You know what, that's a tragedy and I don't know if more people realize um, what's happening out there. Um, so I'm glad that there are synagogues that, that other synagogues can model themselves on. And, and what I recall from my conversation with Sharon Lex Shapiro is that she actually was contacted by the Rabbinical Council of America, which I believe is the Orthodox community's largest umbrella organization right. for rabbis. And they asked her to create guidelines for synagogues. So it seems like we're making some progress. We're trying to. I mean, we've invested a lot in religious movements. So we have a partnership with the reform movement, URJ. We have a partnership with the conservative movement, United Synagogue. Um, and we have a partnership recently announced with Chabad Lubavitch. Uh, in addition to Yaha, which is the Orthodox movement, um, inclusion um, uh, movement. And we're trying to go to the movements and say, listen, the gold standard is to become inclusive. They're all in agreement. And now they're teaching synagogue by synagogue how to do that. Now they have issue, they have examples of, of excellence in their own communities. And so they can shine a light on those examples of excellence. And there's all sorts of inclusion communities that have been formed in synagogues across the United States and Canada and they're moving towards an inclusive model. Jay, it's so clear that you have a passion for advocating for greater inclusion in the community. I'm just curious, where is your passion coming from? Well, our first investment, it, we, we did not have a personal connection to disability. It was an issue of fairness. Why in some families, some children can go to a Jewish day school or Hebrew school, and other children with disabilities, sometimes their brothers and sisters, were excluded. We felt that wasn't a fair um, way to run our community. Um, we do have a personal connection that we learned about after that. My nephew has autism and I think that that just drew the family closer. Also my father who passed away three years ago developed a disability. And when you think about disability, not only is it 20% of our population, 
but all of us, if we live long enough, will develop some form of disability. So it's, it's just pervasive out there. The other thing personally is I see it as a civil right. I see that people with disabilities are a class that's been excluded from participation in our community and general society, and I see that as a mission to help them advocate for their own rights. Jay, you've also been a great advocate for, um, for greater understanding among Israelis of American Jews. Can you tell us a little bit about that and where that comes from? Sure. So our um, approach to philanthropy is philanthropy is interesting where there's a vacuum, where you can come in and do something and have a leadership role. And so the relationship between Israel and the American Jewish community you know, there's so many connections on so many different levels between Israel and the American Jewish community. But the conversation almost always is about Israel. So you have Americans flying over to Israel and they'll talk to Israeli leaders about Gaza and Iran and all the threats facing Israel. And the Israeli leaders will fly over to the United States and it'll be the exact same discussion. No one was really talking about how the Jewish community is changing the assimilation, the connection to Israel and how that's changing, and also that we live in a, in a community that has Reformed Jews and conservative Jews and Orthodox Jews, and in Israel that's not well understood. So we started bringing delegations of Knesset members to the United States, delegations of journalists. We established the first academic program on the American Jewish community at the University of Haifa, and we work in the Knesset. We have a caucus on the American Jewish community. Jay, do you think Israelis take the support of American Jews for granted? I think in some, in some sense they do. And I think it comes from a, a lack of understanding of the community. So it's, it's historically based that you know, Israel has grown in large part because of the political work and the financial contributions of the American Jewish community. And I think that now I'm speaking as, as, as an Israeli who's lived in Israel for the past eight years. I think the view is that Israel is the homeland of, of the Jewish people, that Jews have an obligation to live there, and if they can't live there for whatever reason, they should support the state of Israel. And many Jews do, but I think that that may be changing in our community, and I think that Israelis should understand that. Because if that cadre of Jews who are really doing the heavy lifting and the political work to ensure America is on Israel's side, if that shifts, that's a strategic threat to the state of Israel. And I think that Israeli leaders should understand that. There are leaders, for example, the current prime minister or uh, Isaac Herzog, who's the opposition leader, they completely get it. They have a history of living here and, and living in the Jewish community. But not every Israeli politician has that experience. You know, part of, of what you do at the foundation in terms of um, creating greater understanding of American Jewry in Israel is that you do polling in Israel. Um, and so I found a couple of the questions that you've asked in the past to be really fascinating. One is, how important is it that the Knesset consider diaspora Jews when legislating laws like who is a Jew? So that's a question that you've asked Israelis in the past. And more recently, you've asked them in, a, in an opinion poll. To what extent should Israeli leaders take into account the positions of American Jews on issues related to the peace process? So, Jay, I'm just curious, in, in looking over the results of these opinion polls in Israel, what have you found to be the most surprising? Well, I think the most surprising thing is often the Israeli electorate, the general Israeli population, get the relationship a lot better than their leaders do. So generally, Israelis understand that there's a very powerful, significant American Jewish community out there that's impacted often by decisions in Israel. And you know, I've never advocated that American Jews should have a role in Israeli politics, although I have advocated that American Israelis, Americans who have moved to Israel, should be elected to the Knesset. Um, but I'm not saying that American Jews should vote in Israel. I'm just saying that Israelis and Israeli leaders should understand that there's an important community out there and take them into account when they have legislation that impacts this community. What do you think we could be doing in the U.S. in terms of making sure that, um, that the next generation does continue to feel the, the, the support for Israel as a state? Right. Well, I think that there's a lot being done here 
I mean, the whole birthright, sending you know, people over to Israel, have that personal connection with Israel. There are many, many organizations that are engaged in connecting Jews to Israel. I think in terms of educating Israelis about this community, there's not enough being done. What I would urge our leaders to do, when you go over there with delegations, VIP delegations, and you meet with the Prime Minister, you meet with other members of Knesset, don't just talk about the threats to Israel. Those are significant, and they should be the first on the agenda. But also talk about your own community and talk about the challenges. And what we've advocated with members of Knesset is be more sophisticated in when you speak about issues about the American Jewish community. And don't say things that can be taken um, offense in this community. And, you know, take, for example, um, the lay leadership of APAC that does a lot of the heavy lifting to ensure that, that the United States is solidly behind Israel. Well, a lot of them are connected to the reform movement are, and see themselves as reformed Jews. It's not helpful when a member of Knesset would, will stand up and say, reformed Jews are not really Jews. That's not helpful to the relationship. Um, absolutely. And so can you tell us a little bit about, you're doing a lot of great work in terms of educating Knesset members specifically. Can you tell us a little bit about the Knesset Fellowship Program that you have and also the, the trips that you have um, organized to bring Knesset members to the U.S.? Right. We've taken three delegations of Knesset members um, here. We usually uh, visit Boston, that's our home community, and New York because it's really uh, the largest Jewish community in the United States. Uh, they meet with the leadership, but we try to have them meet with the broad spectrum of, Jew of the Jewish community. And we don't limit uh, anyone having access or, or meeting them. In fact, we do a couple of public events, both in Boston and New York, so that the entire Jewish community has an opportunity to come and interact with the members of Knesset. What do you think they've heard in those town hall style meetings that they didn't expect to hear? Well, I'll give you, I'll give you a good example. Um, when they meet with the heads of the organizations like uh, Rabbi Rick Jacobs from the Reform Movement and Rabbi Stephen Wernick from the Conservative Movement and even Chabad and, and, the, and the Orthodox community, uh, like Richard Joel from, from Yeshiva, they all sit together on the same panel to meet with the members of Knesset. That's shocking to members of Knesset. You know, when we had in our caucus that we help work with um, in the Knesset on the American Jewish community, we had Rick Jacobs, who's head of the Reform Movement, come and meet with members of Knesset. And we wanted an Orthodox rabbi to meet also, to, to, to have a, a point counterpoint in front of the Knesset. Uh, rabbi Stav, who's an Orthodox rabbi, eventually sat with Rabbi Jacobs in the Knesset. But we had asked seven different leading rabbis in Israel to sit down with Rick Jacobs in the Knesset, and they wouldn't agree to do that. Hmm. Can you tell our audience who Rabbi Stav is? Rabbi Stav is the head of the Tsar movement, which is part of the Orthodox, modern Orthodox community in Israel and has emerged as a leading voice in that community. But, but he's also known to be someone who's more open orthodoxly. Is that, is that correct about Rabbi Stav? Yes, I, I think that's true. And that's what made him perhaps open to something that, that your typical you know, candidate for the chief rabbi in Israel is not. Is right. Although I don't think it was comfortable for him. I think he did it because I think he saw the value in espousing his position. Um, but my point is, is that in Israel, it's religious respect for different movements, for different ways of observance is challenging. And in this country, it's less challenging. And you believe that until Israelis have an understanding of that part of the American Jewish community, they're somehow going to lose the connection between our two communities? I think they have to understand that this is a different community. And Jews have a different way of connecting here. And they don't all follow the paradigm that's followed in Israel. In Israel, traditionally, I mean, the reform movement, the conservative movement exists in Israel, but they're not widespread. So in Israel, you have traditional, orthodox, and secular. And even secular Jews, like we had a member of Knesset said, listen, I'm not observant at all, but if I go to a synagogue, I'm going to an Orthodox synagogue. And that's a prevalent attitude in Israel. Um, here in the United States, it's not. And I think Israelis just need to understand that. I'm not trying to convince anyone to change any of their political views or any of the way their religious views. I just want them to have a better understanding of what this community is about. 
Well, I couldn't agree with you more, and I think um, having a greater understanding of American Jewry will help Israeli politicians and, and leaders in general do better in terms of making sure that we do stay connected. Um, and I think that many see Israel and the U.S. as the two poles of the worldwide Jewish community right now. So, right. so it's very important for us to maintain our strength. Um, Jay, you know, you wrote a very beautiful opinion piece um, talking about your father's legacy. And I was just wondering, as, as we wrap up our conversation today, what is the legacy that you would like to leave? And you're a young man, so, so I, I, I must say that and preface my question first by saying that. What is, the, what is the legacy, Jay, that you'd like to leave behind for your own four beautiful children? Well, I think, uh, first of all, as I said before, we want to put ourselves out of business. So we want to get to the point where our community looks more inclusive and, and is, in fact, more inclusive. And, for example, you talk about my children. You know, we bring our children to many different events and, and when we visit programs that we fund because I want them to experience that our community is made up of many different people. You know, I'll tell you one story. We just had a, a, a Yachad Shabbaton in my community, which is in Brookline, Massachusetts. And Richard Bernstein, who's the only blind state Supreme Court justice in the United States, came and spoke. One of the things he said is that in the United States, there's a regulation that says that if you have a dolphin, like in a, in a, in a sea world or, or in, in a zoo, you cannot have one dolphin. You have to have two dolphins. Why? Because we recognize that a dolphin is a social animal and needs that interaction. Well, I can tell you that the unemployment rate for people with disabilities is 70 percent. That means that there are hundreds of thousands of people, Jewish people, in our community that are shut away. They're not working. They're not in the synagogue. They're not in our communities. They're shut away in their homes. That's not how our community should look. So I want to get to the place where that doesn't exist in our community. Jay, I just want to wish you much success in all the incredible work that you're Thank doing, you. that the foundation's doing. Um, we wish you Hatzlacha Raba, as you say in Israel. Thank you. Um, it's really been an honor and a pleasure to be able to share you, Jay Ruderman, with our JBS audience, and I hope that we'll, we'll get to talk some more soon. Thank you. Pleasure's all mine. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.